Thank you so much, Mark and Paula. It really is an honor to be here joining all of you guys and I appreciate your support. And uh, I'll speak for Jeff and myself both. Uh, pardon that we look a little tired. We've been working seven days a week for about the past month and a half or two months. So we are very much looking forward to harvest slowing down and coming to a conclusion, hopefully sometime in October. So um, first I wanna tell you a little bit about Freemark Abbey. Thank you so much for the map. For those of you that aren't super familiar with Napa Valley, we are to the east of Sonoma County, which Jeff will, will go into great depth about. We are in Napa Valley. So the winery was founded in St. Helena, which is uh, farther north uh, in, in Napa Valley than some of our other southern Appalachians. And as Paula said, we are founded in 1886. So we haven't been young for a long time. Uh, we like to think the winemaker doesn't uh, necessarily abide by that same statement. But it was founded by a woman named Josephine Tixon back in another pandemic, the tuberculosis pandemic. Um, she and her husband had come out to the valley to buy some land and start a winery. And he unfortunately passed away due to that pandemic, but she, along with her young children, decided to move forward. They bought a, a plot of land where the winery is currently uh, and built a redwood barn. Now, if you come to visit us, it's a stone winery that was built later on by a man named Anton Forney, who was her cellar foreman. And all of the stones came from a local quarry here in, in Napa Valley. But she grew Riesling, um, Zinfandel, some Burgundy varieties, which is not what Napa Valley is known for now, but that was really popular back then. She sold the winery to her foreman and he continued making wine on this site until prohibition came and the winery went dark. Then in the late 30s, early 40s, three men got together and decided to bring the winery back to life. Their names were Charles Freeman, Mark Foster, and Abby Ahern. That's where we get our name. They put their three names together, Free Mark Abby, to give us our current name. So no religious association, but uh, we drink like we were monks. So uh, we, we enjoy that very much. Then the, the winery went dark again after Abby passed away and came back to life in the late 60s. Seven friends and business partners who were based mostly in Rutherford and had some vineyard land. Um, you can see Rutherford's a little farther south than where the winery is brought the winery back to life and in its current iteration. And they were really avant-garde pioneers back then. They really invested in vineyard land. They also had one of the first tasting rooms in Napa Valley. That wasn't a popular thing back then. And they also founded one of the first library programs. So I'm sitting here in our, our library tasting room that you can see. We have one of the largest and most in-depth wine libraries in Napa Valley. And so if you come visit us, we, we have those wines available for you guys to try. And it's something we really take a lot of pride in. So that's the, then Freemark Abbey was purchased by Jackson family in 2006 and brought us to our current iteration. We have incredible vineyards here in Napa Valley, um, great technology that we use in the winery, really focus on making vineyard driven, varietally expressive wines that, that we love sharing with you guys. Uh, I started with Jackson family in 2016. I had originally was born and raised in Texas, grew up around agriculture and then went into medical research. So I loved combining science and nature, which it led me to winemaking. And I thought the, the perfect way to combine those two. So I've been with the company for five years now. I took over for Ted Edwards, who was a winemaker for 40 years here at Freemark Abbey uh, with a wealth of knowledge and history. And so it's very, very honorable and uh, humbling to take over this position. So I can't wait to share these wines with you guys through the session. I guess it's my turn, huh? Yeah, I was going to say it's your, your turn, Jeff. Oh, me. Well, good to see you, Christy. Good to see everybody out there. Um, as Christy mentioned, we're knee deep in it out here, which uh, is a great change from last year where we were worried about fires and all kinds of crazy things going on. So this year, we're very happy bringing in some really, really tasty fruit and looking forward to a great vintage. But a little bit about um, Hartford Family Winery. Um, I love the intro um, that Paul threw out. It's, it's really, that that is our credo and our ethos here. Um, really looking and making wines that are distinct, unique, have personality. You can call that terroir, you can call it anything you want, but um, there, there has been a passion around that since 1994 when the winery was founded. So um, back in 94, Don and Jenny Hartford uh, partnered up with Jenny's dad, there's a guy named Jess Jackson, probably heard of him before. Um, and this was a passion project for them living in the, in the Russian River Valley. Don was working for the 
the bigger family in the, in the legal department. He's, he's an attorney and uh, was chief counsel, but had spent many, many, many days and, and nights in the winery, the original KJ winery up in Lakeport and worked with a lot of the winemakers after hours, just learning more and more about wine, just got enthralled with it. And uh, the Russian River was their home. So they, they thought, let's start up a little project here. And it was a very humble, small project. In, in 94, we made three different wines, a few hundred cases of each, uh, three single vineyard bottlings. Two of those were Pinot Noir. One of them was an old vine Zinfandel. Um, we, uh, to fast forward a bit, we have expanded that lineup a little bit over the years to the point today where I'll bottle over 40 wines every year. Um, 36 of those are single vineyards each year. Um, and, and of those 30, those 36 are going to be, you know, two or 300 cases each. So very small production of distinct, unique, um, high personality, high terroir driven, uh, sites that make special wine. So you can see a little overview of our, of our <clears throat> excuse me, of our home on the left there. Uh, the big green blob in the middle of Sonoma County, there is the Russian River Valley. That is our home. The winery is right on the red dot there in a little uh, hamlet called Forestville. Um, it's a little different than Napa over here. Uh, we don't have a stoplight. We do have a gas station and a dive bar, thank God, um, or we wouldn't survive. But uh, that's that's our home right there. That's where I'm sitting today. Um, when you look around on that map, you can see a lot of little dots. You may or may not be able to read, but a lot of vineyards around the Russian River area um, that I'll talk about when we get into the Chardonnay. And then on the right, you can see sort of a bigger blow up of, uh, of California, even going up into Oregon and all the way down to Santa Barbara. Um, we've, we've expanded out from our humble roots in the Russian River Valley um, and the Sonoma Coast into the Anderson Valley and Mendocino, down into Carneros, Marin County, which is between San Francisco uh, and Sonoma County, and uh, all the way up to Oregon into the Willamette Valley, where we make uh, a Pinot Noir and producing a Chardonnay. It's not released yet, but uh, wonderful properties up there we work with. And then several wines from the Santa Barbara County area. So Santa Rita Hills, we do uh, a Chardonnay, a Pinot Noir, and then a really fun Chenin Blanc from San Inez. So we're not afraid to kind of go into new and different places. I don't know what's next. Maybe it's, uh, I don't know, maybe it's the Okanagan. I don't know what will be next, but it's, it's a lot of fun here. Uh, but that single vineyard focus has driven us for years. We, as we'll talk about in a bit, um, also make some multi-vineyard blends. Uh, we'll taste uh, one of those today and talk that through. But the winery, um, you know, still in the original site, you can see behind me here. Hopefully you can kind of see the barrel room over my shoulder. That's actually uh, our only barrel room. You guys are out there filling Chardonnay barrels today and, uh, and it's pretty much full tilt there, so. Um, that's, that's a little history on us. I've been, I've been making wine um, over here in the Russian River since 1990. Uh, I made wine over in Napa for four years before uh, moving over here. Um, so my, my start was over there in the Napa Valley. Um, I just found myself gravitating the, to Pinot Noir production and being closer to the ocean out here was, was really a wonderful thing. So I, I moved over here. So I don't know, this is Harvest 35 or 36 for me. And um, I don't know, every year I think Christy would agree. It's, it's, it's tiring, it's stressful, but it's the most fun time of the year. It's the, it's the reason we do this. It's nonstop, just energy, excitement, absolute tired, long days, but in the end, it's all worth it. So that's, that's why we do what we do. So maybe we can talk about wines because you're probably bored listening to us go blah, blah, blah. Uh, I was going to say you were talking about Chardonnay being filled behind you. So why don't you uh, talk about uh, your Russian River Chardonnay and what makes it unique and special. And then we'll talk about uh, Christie's uh, Napa Chard. Sounds great. So, yeah, we do. Um, we make 11 different Chardonnays, soon to be 12 Chardonnays here at Hartford. Um, so we, we do a lot of single vineyards, as I mentioned. The Russian River Valley actually pulls together all of our single vineyard sites within the Russian River Valley. Um, that green blob that was on the map is, is the Russian River AVA, and it's very much influenced by the ocean. Um, where I'm sitting today, we're about 14 miles from the ocean. The Russian River AVA gets, gets within uh, probably about eight, nine miles of the ocean. 
on the western flank there and goes all the way inland towards Santa Rosa and then north up to the town of Healdsburg. So it's a pretty, you know, it's a broad AVA that uh, can have a lot of different little subclimates and microclimates within it. So our, the beauty of the Russian River Chardonnay that, that we're talking about and some of us are tasting today, I hope, um, is the idea of pulling from all these different regions. And um, these different regions, or as we call them neighborhoods in the Russian River, all have their own sort of personality. So up in the northern part of that map, um, it's a touch warmer uh, because you're a little bit further from where the cold air comes in off the ocean. So you get in, in, into some more tropical, almost flavors up there and, and richness and baked pears, things like that. As we go down into the Green Valley where, where the winery is, um, you get into much more of that coastal influence, brighter acidity, much more lemon, citrus driven wines. Um, you have a little shift in soil types as you go to the east into what we call Laguna Ridge. You get more iron in the soils there. So suddenly Chardonnay goes from bright lemon lime crisp to bright but really broad and this really textural character that comes through because of that soil difference. And then the further south you go, the, the higher the acid gets, the brighter, the more tightly wound the wines get. Think, think you know, more in the direction of Chablis, where you're really dealing with, with bright acidity, searing acidity in some, in some cases. Um, to give you a sense, um, you know, in these cooler areas like, like that area and then out at Seascape, um, you know, we're picking sparkling wine right now. I'm also picking Chardonnay for still wine, you know, at about four degrees higher bricks um, on the same day. So that gives you a sense of kind of the, the, the complexity we have within this little ABA. And it really shows in the glass. So when you smell this wine, you're going to see a sense of the vineyard. And when I say vineyard, it's really vineyards. And you get some of that, that riper fruit, uh, the baked apple and pear. You're certainly going to see the delicate floral pieces. You're going to see the citrus green apple from Green Valley, um, really focused acidity and great balance. So we barrel ferment our Chardonnay 100%. Um, we put all of our Chardonnays through 100% malolactic fermentation. Uh, this, this wine sees about 25 to 30% new French oak, um, but we never, we're never using barrels to be the wine. Uh, for me, barrels are a way to kind of build the wine up and support the wine and bring characters out from the vineyards. So if any of you look at me across the table someday when we're tasting our Chardonnay and you, you, you look at me and you say, wow, this Chardonnay has great oak, I might cry um, and I will absolutely feel like I failed because any, any monkey can go out and buy a bunch of expensive oak and over oak their wines. Um, the, the ability to use a barrel to bring character out but not be the character of the wine is really a very important piece of our wines because they are such high acidity and, and su such concentrated bright wines. Um, we use the barrels to sort of temper that. We don't use any cultured yeasts or bacteria, malolactic bacteria here. So everything is a native ferment, very much trying to just let the vineyard do what it wants to do in the winery. It's, it's in my mind, our job as winemakers to babysit and not force wines into a direction. Um, if you have to force a wine in a direction, it probably means you have the wrong variety planted in the wrong place and you're trying to fix them. We don't believe in fixing things. We believe in planting in the right place, growing the fruit the right way, getting it here and not screwing it up. And that's a very simple process if you, if you have the, the right vineyards, and I think we do. Bottle then find unfiltered. Um, so just really, again, a hands-off style to let the vineyards show through. And that's an extension of what we do with our single vineyards. The single vineyards express one little two acre property and it speaks to that place. This Russian River blend, probably 13, 14 different vineyards now, expresses the Russian River as a whole and lets each of those vineyards speak and be part of the story. So that, that's kind of what the Russian River Chardonnay is about for us and hope you guys enjoy it out there. I guess, Christy, it's your turn to talk about Napa. 
Thank you, Mark. Um, I, I always love following Jeff in these things. And I think uh, Jeff can attest to one of the things we love working for Jackson Family Wines is we not only get to be colleagues, but we can be friends and, and share each other's wines. So I probably drink more of Jeff's wines than my own. And, and I think he does a really remarkable job with Chardonnay. If you happen to have both of these wines, um, you'll see they're, they're quite different in style. And I think Jeff really touched on the beauty of where his vineyard sites are and the, the temperature and the soil there compared to what we have in Napa. We're farther east, um, and, and the temperature in Napa is, is counterintuitive to what you would think. The farther south you go, the cooler it is, uh, and that's proximity to the San Francisco uh, Delta and, and the, the marine influence. So whereas just marine influence probably comes from the west and heads east, ours actually comes from the south and heads north. Um, if, you, if you look at the map where all the, the dark shaded areas is, that's the valley and there's mountains on either side. So when the fog rolls in, it comes in through Carneros. And Carneros in the south on that map is the only Appalachian that, that is in Sonoma and Napa County as well. And they, they decided to keep it one Appalachian because the characteristics are so similar in both counties. So a man-made boundary does not equate to a, a nature-made boundary. So about 50% of my wine comes from there. And that's got really bright acidity. All of those citrus characters that Jeff was talking about, we also get those in Carneros. It's, it's very close to the, the bay. And so lots of marine influence, really cool temperatures, um, really nice, even ripening. And so we get really beautiful acidity, a lot of like lemon curd and some, some orange blossom, really, really pretty bright acid wines. And so that forms the backbone of this wine. And then I source from um, Coombsville. If you look right under the big valley word, there's, there's a, a little dot that says Rancho Sarco. Um, that, that's the fruit I just brought in today. It's my, my latest ripening stuff. It's a clone of Chardonnay that's got tons of bright acidity. But that's where I get what people think of as very classic Napa Valley Chardonnay characters, a lot of baked apple, pear, some brioche characters. And I do use a little bit more oak than Jeff does, but that's because it's warmer here. And so the wine actually really benefits from that. So, so just as Jeff said, I don't want you tasting this and saying, you know, oh, there, there's tons of good oak in that. I use about 40, 45% new oak in this, but the warmer climate really enhances that. And, and, and they work really symbiotically well with that amount of new oak. And, and those two sites I put through some partial malolactic fermentation. I don't do 100% because I want to keep some nice, bright, fresh acidity in the wine. I think that helps wine be really food friendly, um, but also just really refreshing when you have it on your own. But I want some of those malolactic characters, some of that, that brioche and, and that vanilla that really adds complexity and, and beauty into the wine. And then the third site I get from is our Keys Vineyard up on Howe Mountain. So if you look farther up on that map, um, Howe Mountain, it's a high elevation site, Keys Vineyard. M most people would think that's where you would grow Cabernet, and that's true, but it also is a very cool site in, in an otherwise warm region around it. And so we've got some Chardonnay up there that has these beautiful like, fresh pineapple tropical characteristics. And so if you come to the wine where we actually have um, two single vineyard bottlings, a Keys Chardonnay and one from our Carneros Vineyard. And this is a blend of, of those two sites plus the, the Rancho Sarco site. And, and what we do is we put this, we barrel ferment most of it. I would say 85 to 90% of it is barrel fermented. I like a little stainless steel fermentation as well to keep the wine fresh. And we said 40% new oak and partial malolactic, probably about 50%. And so we age that in barrel for about 10 months and then bottle it in, in the summer before harvest. And I think this wine is just a really classic interpretation of Napa Valley Chardonnay. It, it's great if you want to drink it on its own, just a glass when you get home from work. That's probably what I'm going to do today because it's been a long harvest day already. Um, it, I love this, but to me, this is a lobster wine, though. It's a, I spent a little time on the east coast of the country and, and lobster rolls are one of my favorite foods of all time. And if I could get one here in Napa, that's totally what I would pair this with. But I, I love this with seafood, chicken, pasta. I think it's a really fun wine to pair this with. Well, I, I know the Chardonnay up on uh, at Keys up on Howell is some of the most coveted Chardonnay in, in, in the company. So I'm wondering how many winemakers you had to arm wrestle to, uh, to get your <laughs> well, hands only on. Only Chris Carpenter, and, and he's not that big, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, before moving on to uh, to Jeff's Pinot, I just wanted to quickly point out, uh, you know, Jeff, you talked about, you know, making Chardonnay from small, specific two-acre sites, so very, very small production but uh, even though this wine comes from Napa, we're talking less than 5,000 cases. So again, uh, uh, very small production, uh, limited availability wines. So um, Jeff, if you wanna talk about uh, some of your Pinots and maybe how you and Don always like to 
select and select and select back uh, and move wines uh, around into smaller programs or larger programs, uh, I'll turn it over to you. All right, yeah. So we, I mentioned we make 11, 12 Pinot, Chardonnays each vintage. Uh, Pinot Noir, I believe we're up to 17 different bottlings right now. So uh, a lot of people look at me and other winemakers, people in the business, you know, Psalms out there, they look and, and say, well, why do you do that? That just, how do you keep track of it, number one, and why do you do it? Well, each of these sites, again, gives us something different. And when we find a new place that gives us a wine that has um, some sort of defining characteristic, um, I don't know, we just fall for it. And that's, that's where, you know, we started out in 94, we made two Pinot Noirs from the Russian River Valley. The Arundel Vineyard, which we still produce today, and then a, a wine called Dutton Sanchetti. And um, that they were both in the heart of the, the Russian River, Green Valley, amazing wines. We still produce a rental today. That's our oldest Pinot Noir planting, uh, checking in at about 46 years old today. Um, but you know, when we start, started planting vineyards and purchasing some properties that were already planted back in the mid-90s to sort of uh, keep growing this, this program, um, we found you know, all these wonderful sites in the Russian River, of course. But the Sonoma Coast was really somewhat uncharted. I mean, there were, there were vineyards out there, but not a lot. And when I talk about the Sonoma Coast, that's really the most Western part of uh, the Sonoma County area. So we think of that as being sort of, you know, from the coast about in, in about five, six, seven miles, really. There's a, a little slice out there where you have coastal ridges that have uplifted uh, because of all the tectonic and volcanic activity. So, you know, 30 million, 20 million years ago, all these vineyards that we grow grapes on out there on the coast were actually part of the ocean floor. So they were underwater. So we have the same soil type in some of the vineyards out there like Far Coast, which is uh, up on the Northern part of the Sonoma Coast. It's exactly the same soil type. Yeah, if you look at the map there, Far Coast is all the way up there. It's almost into Mendocino County. Um, that vineyard is about four miles from the ocean and sits up at about a thousand foot elevation. So 300 plus meters sitting there on a coastal ridge. And then imagine that being an ocean bottom, you know, millions of years ago. That's the kind of crazy topography we deal with out here. It's really, really interesting. So you walk around in this vineyard and you know, when we planted and developed, it was an old apple orchard we purchased. Um, when we developed it, you know, you're kicking up seashells up at a thousand foot elevation. And you look behind you right next to the vineyard are 2000 year old redwood trees. So it's, it's one of the most surreal places in the world and beautiful. But up there at, at Far Coast, you, you make uh, wines with a lot of power, a lot of structure. Um, so we do a single vineyard from there, but then we also blend that vineyard with a vineyard we call Seascape, which is about 20 miles south of that. And the Seascape vineyard is also four miles from the ocean, also a thousand foot elevation. The difference being it's on the first coastal ridge. So it looks down at the ocean, takes the brunt of all the cold air fog that comes in every afternoon. So Seascape would be directly west of the Russian River there. <clears throat> and basically you're looking at the ocean. So single vineyards from both of those, but then we make this wine called Land's Edge, which we're talking about here, that's a blend of the two. So it's really kind of um, like we would do with the Russian River blend, taking, in this case, two sites and sometimes three um, and blending them together to kind of capture the essence of the entire coast there. So picture that strip from Annapolis, far coast, coming all the way down to Seascape, you know, about eight miles wide, just a, a group of coastal ridges going from a thousand, you know, 600 up to 1500 foot. Um, the, the wines are just, they're very different than what we see in the Russian River. And as I mentioned, Far Coast, the Northern property gives us more texture, more structure, more tannin, darker fruits. When you go down to Seascape, uh, that Pinot Noir tends to be very savory. It's, it's very much, I mean, I equate Seascape, um, if you love like Lagavulin or Lafroig, you love an Isla single malt, peaty, earthy, kind of funky seascapes for you. So we're blending this really kind of 
funky, earthy Pinot Noir from Seascape with this big, fruity kind of monster from, from Far Coast. And you end up, they're two wines you wouldn't think would work well, and yet they blend together beautifully. They really complement each other. They fill in little nooks and crannies. And in the end, you get a wine with incredible power and concentration, but elegance as well. And the acidity that you maintain out there being so close to the ocean is a huge part of the wines as well, which gives them incredible ageability. And, you know, these wines are, are, are wonderful when they're young, but they age extremely well. So the Land's Edge is kind of, it kind of sits in a, in a price point and in a volume, production volume in between our single vineyard, you know, small, small quantities and the slightly larger Russian River. So it's, it's a wine we usually have supply of and uh, really, again, speaks to the Sonoma Coast. And uh, I think it's, it's, it's a great expression of that place. And if you can't go visit it yourself, this is a great way to actually kind of get a sense of what it's like. I just like how Jeff says, this is a wine that we have some supply of. And again, production is around 2,500 boxes. So uh, <laughs> that's a lot. That's a lot for us, you know. Yeah, and there's some vintages out on the coast. It's again, we, we have this, this high risk, high reward concept. Seascape is the, is the poster child for high risk, high reward. There's vintages out there where we'll get quarter ton, half a ton an acre. So it, it literally costs in, in 2000, well, there's been several vintages, but in the last 10 years, we've had two vintages that nearly cost us about $37,000 a ton to farm the little bit of fruit that was out there. When you do the math on that to figure out how many cases you get out, we're losing money every time we sell a bottle. But the yeah. wine's so good, you can't help yourself. So. So Jeff, we have our first question into the chat about uh, the areas of, of the Russian River uh, drying up uh, with drought conditions. Can you uh, touch on that? I don't know if you're reading the question yourself right now, but uh. yeah, I'm just looking. But yeah, I mean the drought. We we are in a drought here. Um, kind of touch on a few different areas. We talked about that. Um, you know, we normally here at the winery we would get uh, roughly 30 inches of rain a year. Out on the coast at Seascape or Far Coast, it's typically more like 90 inches of rain a year. Uh, this last winter, we, we got about 11 or 14 here. I can't remember which. It doesn't really matter because it was next to nothing. And out on the coast, we had about 25 inches. So here in the Russian River and up into Mendocino County and even over in Napa, all, all over the North Coast, you know, we, we've definitely been in a, in a, a drought situation. Now, a lot of our vineyards are dry farmed. And those are vineyards that kind of go down and find water. Um, some of those will struggle even in, in a year like this where the water table just gets so low, we don't have a lot of available water. So we kind of knew this going into the vintage. Um, we, we pruned differently in quite a few vineyards to kind of hold the vine back a little bit and not, not put out so much wood where we're gonna get too much growth for the, the amount of water we had. Um, there are vineyards where we literally pruned some of the box back and dropped the food in them um, down a vineyard we call Jennifer's in the uh, southern part of Russian River. We just have no water down there. And uh, we literally um, sacrificed fruit for the year to protect the vines for next year. We, we put the little water we had on the best blocks there to make the, the wines that we want. So it's forced us to make some decisions. Uh, again, we don't water, we don't irrigate a lot of our vineyards, you know, extensively. Uh, but it's nice having that in warmer years. Uh, so this year, we're kind of trying to balance it all. In the end, I we see a smaller crop this year. Um, but the quality, I think, all of us are just kind of jumping, jumping through hoops and very excited about the potential of the wines from this vintage. Out on the coast, we're really happy. Seascape, it's, it's one of the best seascape vintages I can remember. Um, again, they had 20 plus inches of rain out there, so that helps a lot. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I don't know, if, Christy. You have similar thoughts on on drought and the wines over in Napa. I do. Yeah, we're we're in a very similar situation. A lot of our properties have wells on them, and they just don't have water to keep up. So we we very much 
cut back on water early on. And to just point, the quality is incredible. It, it's made really, really small berries off of um, quite small canopies this year. And so our color and our tannin extraction is phenomenal. But we've also really leaned into using recycled water. So down in Carneros, where we just historically have very minimal amounts of groundwater, it's a region that doesn't have much. But we've been piping in recycled water, which is something I think Northern California is embracing quite a bit and in metropolitan areas as well as agriculture. Um, and it's a great way to really uh, minimize the use of some of our natural resources. And so we, we do that at the winery and at a couple of our vineyards as well. Um, but with as cool of a season as it was, we're actually a little ahead of our ripening trend. So it's good we could get the fruit off the vine a little bit earlier and, and use a little less water than we normally would have. But yes, all, all the same things Jeff's talking about in Sonoma County are happening now as well. well I'm glad we just touched on water because obviously water is a very important thing to uh, to the family and our initiatives and sustainability and our partnership with Torres for, you know, uh, International Wines for Climate Action, but that'd be a completely separate other uh, <laughs> webinar, but uh, um, I'm happy that we touched on Chardonnay and, and Pinot Noir, the, uh, the two signature grapes of, of the Russian River, if I can call it that, and Chardonnay, and, and now we'll touch on Cabernet, the other signature grape of, of the Napa Valley. So uh, I'll put a tasting note into the chat and uh, let you go. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, uh, to your point, yes, uh, Cabernet is king over here in Napa Valley, and we've been making it since 1967 at Fremark Abbey. So we've got a little history with the grape. Um, and, and just like Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, it is critically important to plant Cabernet in the right places. Um, and, and Napa Valley is actually quite diverse. We have high, ele high elevation mountain sites. We've got valley floor sites that are close to the river. Those are not ideal for Cabernet. Those are better for Merlot and Sauvignon Blanc. And so we really spent decades honing in where the best vineyard locations are for this. And this is our Napa Valley blend. We do make a number of single vineyard Cabernets, just like Jeff does with Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. And so this is a blend from all of those great vineyards that we have to bring you a real snapshot of, of what Napa Valley can produce. So if you look at the top of the map uh, over on the left, Calistoga is our northernmost vineyard. We, we have a property up there that grows some really great Cabernet. It's on the valley floor. It's quite warm up in Calistoga. So from that warmer climate with volcanic soil, we get a lot of really beautiful red fruit characters. If you think black cherry, pomegranate, a lot of bright baking spices. So that's a really lovely um, fruit driven kind of appellation with that warmer climate. When you go a little bit farther south, if you see on the left side of the map, there's Spring Mountain. We have a small vineyard up there, as well as um, some up on Howl Mountain. Those mountain sites that are more volcanic and a uh, bigger diurnal swing, that's a fancy word we use for meaning the difference in temperature between the night and the day. You guys probably have a, a lot of that in Canada like we do here. We, we love a big difference in temperature. It keeps the acid really bright. It keeps the wines really lively. So we get a lot of cool um, like graphite earthy characters from those mountain sites at that high elevation and really bright acidity and really great color. If you go a little further south, there's the Rutherford Appalachian. And, and that was really home for Fremark Abbey's vineyards for quite some time. We make a Boucher and a Sycamore single vineyard Cabernet. And those are really, really beautiful wines in that they've got great dark fruit characters, blackberry, um, some, some black cherry, some plums in there as well and a lot of texture in the middle, some creaminess and, and some round supple characters. And tannins that, um, if you've ever heard the phrase Rutherford dust, it, it's kind of a, a characteristic that is like forest floor in the nose, but these tannins that have a dusty characteristic on the palate. And, and we love that in terms of classic Napa Cabernet. And then we also source from Oakville. We've got a great vineyard there. It's got more like boysenberry forest fruit characters um, and some really rich tannin structure on the back end. So we blend all of those vineyards together in proportions that we think work really well together. And unlike Pinot and Chardonnay, we do more of a Bordeaux style of blending. So we blend a few other great varieties into those wines. We have Cabernet Franc, Petit Verdot, Malbec, and Merlot. And so we'll blend those in different percentages based on the year and based on what the vintage is giving us to really round out and complete the wine. We love all that together. We put it in new oak about 35%. So not a, a large amount of new oak compared to a lot of, of our competitors in the area. And then we age it in barrel for 24 to 26 months to really round out all those tannins and bring all the characteristics together. So if you have it in your glass, I think it really displays the beautiful complexity of fruit from red to blue to purple black fruits 
and then all kinds of cool forest floor characteristics, some cigar box, baking spices. And I love this wine paired with food. I, I think you can drink Cabernet on its own. Plenty of people do, but I love this with, with a steak, with anything on the grill. Um, and I, I love started to pair vegetables with red wine because I know people don't think that that's a real easy thing to do. But if you think about the color of the vegetable and the color of the wine, you kind of match them together. So think portobello mushrooms, eggplants, um, you know, if you grains like lentils and, and the, some of the, the black rice and, and farro, I think it goes really great with those as well. So we, we really love Cabernet. It's what we do here. I, I don't make as many wines as Jeff. I only make 21 wines and that's hard enough for me to keep track of. So I have no idea how he does it. Um, and we blend from a variety of sites as well. So you can see a lot of similarities in what we do within the company, but also the, the vast differences in the, the personalities and the expressions the wines from all, all of our different sites and the different varietals we produce and the styles in, in which we do that. You saw that with the Chardonnay and then with Cabernet, we just really lean into a, a very classic style Cabernet here that's balanced, it's food friendly. We know most people drink wine within the week or 48 hours that they bring it home. So we wanna make sure that those wines are really delicious in the restaurant, off the store shelf. But what's really important to me is that these wines will age in the cellar really well. So. I just did a 40 year retrospective tasting of, of Fremark Abbey right before harvest and wines 40 years back are still showing beautifully. And so we wanna make sure that that uh, remains true to character in all of our wines, just like all the wines in our life. So thank you for that. Did I did I not get the invite to that tasting, Christy? I must have been out of town. Or... Jeff, I, I, I saved some for you. They're, they're, um, they're in the back. Next time you come over to Napa, we'll have some. <laughs> So Christy, there's a question in the chat about uh, vineyard sites. And so when I look at the uh, the tasting note, I see that it lists Oakville, then Adelon, then Boshin, and then Sycamore. Are those in the percentage highest uh, proportion uh, to the smallest? Uh, you know, it really depends on the vintage and how things are, are cropping out. The 2017 vintage was a, a much smaller volume just because it, it was a very warm year. But by and large, um, Oakville and Adelon is a, the vineyard up in Calistoga. Those are our two main sites, and they're usually between 10, 20 and 30% of the blend each. Um, and then Boucher and Sycamore, it really depends on, on how much we get each year because I make the single vineyard wines first. And so if I have plenty left over, 2018 will be a great uh, indication of that. I put more of those in. So it really depends on where wines fit the best, not you know, a, a recipe every year. And so those are our main sites. And then the mountain sites, they're, they're variable every year too. So we, we put it together in a way that really makes sense for the vintage. Awesome. And I loved your comment about uh, vegetables and uh, I bought myself a new charcoal barbecue smoker. And I find that if you get some of those vegetables and give them that, just that little bit of kiss of heat and smoke, uh, it can work with some of the, the heavier wines there. So it really does. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any other questions or comments that you want to uh, talk about each other's wines and or just uh, uh, what makes uh, each of your sites uh, uh, perfect for, for, for producing these varietals? Jeff, you want to go first? Oh, I gosh, I was hoping someone would have questions for us because we, we just tend to blather on too much about all this. <laughs> I don't know. There's got who has that question you've always want to ask two winemakers. Someone's got to have a good question. What no? was the last concert you went to? Last concert I went to was Fish. About uh, well, it was the very beginning of harvest. I actually skipped a day of harvest to go see Fish. I will admit. So. Did, you, did you go alone or did you go with? Uh... Oh, we had a whole squad that went. We we have a, a number of people that yeah enjoy going to concerts so and yeah we have a good time meet up with people from all over the country christy did you go to bottle rock i did briefly um i, I worked in the mornings and then went in the afternoon so those yeah. of you not familiar we have a, a bit of a music festival here in napa it's all outdoors so safe um and it was my dream come true to see dave Grohl and the food fighters that was uh yeah, i was gonna was say I, 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 I'm, I missed that one you know, here in Forestville, we don't have Foo Fighters and Dave Gold playing <laughs> in the Forestville Youth Park, you know. We might have an, a, an accordion guy on the corner, that's about it. No, but you have one of the coolest dive bars, I think, in Northern California, so. We, we do, we do have the Forestville Club, so. 
We have two questions in the chat, one uh, anonymous, maybe we'll start with that one because it's uh, talking about uh, oak and it, that you might have slightly differing views on uh, on the use of oak in, in, in winemaking. And then the second question is, when you're not drinking wine, what are you drinking? I'll, I'll answer the drinking one first. Um, <laughs> I, I think uh, if I'm drinking spirits, it's a gin and tonic or a really lovely scotch. But usually when it's not my wines, it's champagne or Jeff's wines. Well, I would say on the on the beverage side, yeah, the, the gin thing kind of holds true with most winemakers, I think. Um, so it can go a lot of different directions with gin, but um, I, I'm a sucker for just about anything. I love mezcal. I love a good mezcal Paloma with a splash of Campari. Try that one at home, kids. It's tasty. Uh, brown spirits never treat you wrong. I've, I've learned that. But this time of year, it's really interesting. I think a lot of us just want a cold beer at the end of the day. Um, we're lucky we have a, a couple couple local breweries here, um, Russian River Brewing Company that makes a beer every year for all the wineries. Um, called It takes a lot of great beer to make great wine. And they deliver cases of beer to us. And it's low alcohol, so we can function. And then a seismic uh, has canned up a bunch of beers that have no label on them that are these... Uh, Kind of light, it's a light Kolsch style that's perfect for harvest. So, you know, and the guys out in the cellar, uh, the, the, we kind of have a split group here Pacifico or Modelo. And it's kind of like Hatfields and McCoy's thing. So, you got to pick the right beer to keep everyone happy or have both beers to keep everyone happy. Let's barrels. Yeah, and barrels. And barrels. Use on barrels. Uh, on the serious note, there's some really good beers made in barrels around here as well. but I don't know. I think I think probably Chrissy and I think about barrels the same way. Um, with the great varieties, you know, we have crossover with Chardonnay, obviously, but with Pinot Noir and Cabernet, I think that's where the biggest swings and differences were, would probably appear. As I look at uh, the barrels we use for Pinot Noir, have to be very delicate, have to be very elegant, or they can overpower Pinot Noir. What's interesting is. We use Bordeaux style barrels for our old vine Zinfandel actually. So they're, they're Chateau Ferret thin stave um, barrels that are really meant for Cabernet. And those barrels just integrate perfectly with the, with the big sins, whereas they can be very much overpowering for the Pinot Noirs. So I think we all have kind of our own little favorites, but I don't know, wouldn't you say that Pinot and Cabernet are probably the, the polar opposites when it comes to barrel choices and decisions, Christy, what do you think? I, I would say that's spot on. And I think wh where we would agree is we don't want the barrel to ever overpower our wine. However, there's such different expressions of wine that they require different barrels. I, if I used Pinot barrels on my Cabernet, it would be a silly waste of money. It, it, you, it would do nothing for the wine. It would actually inhibit it from being it, its best expression. So I use barrels that, that have a bigger tannin impact and they, and they have a little bit more toast to them. They're a little richer that's what really helps integrate all the tannins and all the complexity. I also age in barrel for a whole year longer than Jeff does probably um, just because of the structure of the wine. It needs that. If I bottled my Cabernets at the same time, Jeff bottled his Pinot Noir, you'd, you'd call me and complain like these wines are tannic and they're rough and they're, they're not integrated. Um, so we have to think about what's best for the wine and pick barrels and winemaking styles that, that match that wine and that vineyard site. So the, those have very different expressions, but I think we have the end goal in mind of, of really letting the wine sing instead of the barrels. And Christy, you talked about uh, drinking a lot of Jeff's wine. There's a question in the chat about which of his wines are your favorite. And I guess- oh, like, like, like I could keep all of Jeff's wine straight. I can't keep all of mine straight. <laughs> I, I was talking to him the other day, though, and I told him I, I had a bottle of Haley's um, and I had grilled some. I, I did a rack of lamb. I, I felt like being fancy during harvest. It's usually tacos and burrito takeout, but it was a Sunday night and I had a few minutes. And, and so I did some some farro with olives as, as a base and then a, a grilled rack of lamb on top of the bottle of Haley's. I thought that was delicious. And, and Jess, you have to Sounds pick one? Good. Well, I mean, I love I love Boche and Sycamore both and they're different and they're both stunning wines. I mean, obviously for me, I, I love Cabernet. 
you know, I, I started working over in Napa and made Cabernet back in the day. I still love it, but obviously found a bigger passion for Pinot Noir. So I, you know, when I trade wine, it's always trying to find Cabernets and, and Bordeaux varieties that, that I love. But I, I have to say, honestly, the, the Napa Valley blend that Christy does is, I think, one of the stupidest values around. I mean, it's such, it's an amazing wine at an amazingly affordable price for Napa Cabernet. So, I mean, that, that wine's just a go-to for me to just, you know, I mean, I can go to our little local, your wine store, the company wine store where we can buy wines. And, you know, if we haven't traded in a while, I'll go over there and just get a six pack for that. So I have just something to pop open on a Sunday afternoon when I'm cooking a steak or something. It's just so good. You know, people forget about, I don't know, the idea that the wine, everybody's trying to make wines that make statements and are flashy and flashier and flashiest. People forget sometimes the wine's just supposed to taste good sometimes. And I think that Napa Cab totally does that. So I don't know. I, I, I don't mind spending more money, but when I find wines that are, I think, great values, that's, that's a cool thing for me. So, so there's a question into not the Q&A, but into the chat um, that talks about uh, uh, viticulture and how do you work the Zinfandel to bring out so much balance and freshness? and uh, I will add that uh, your Old Vine Zin is one of my most favorite wines to taste people blind with because they're blown away at the end uh, that, that, wait a second, this is Zinfandel. So uh, if you want to just touch on that wine, uh, that'd be awesome. Yeah, the Zin, the Zin program at Hartford is something that to some people is sort of forgotten about because they think Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Um, other people just think of us as a Zinfandel producer, honestly, because they are Zin heads. But um, we, we got into the Zinn business uh, because Don and Jenny, uh, when they moved to Sonoma County, bought a little farmhouse that had, a at that point, 80-year-old vineyard behind it. Um, it was an old Zinn vineyard. And uh, so in 94, we produced the Hartford Vineyard Zinfandel, and it immediately became a fan favorite. But uh, what really drives the style, I think, of, of all the Hartford Zinfandels, we make seven of them now, um, is really a combination of things, but location is the biggest thing. So we are growing these grapes in the Russian River Valley. They're all vineyards that are 100 to 125 years old now. So vine age plays a big part, but the biggest driver is being in a slightly cooler climate. Um, we still get these beautiful, big, ripe Zinfandel berry characters. We don't go as far as jammy and syrupy because it is a little bit cooler, but you know, these are wines that have a fair amount of alcohol in them, but because you have that acidity that kind of refreshes your palate and keeps the wine alive, um, you don't see the wines as being big and ponderous. I mean, I love big, big ripe juicy zins from warmer climates like Paso or Lodi or the foothills, uh, but Russian River zins have, have a real personality again that kind of speaks to elegance. And when you talk about elegance in a wine that's 15, 15 and a half alcohol, that's kind of weird, but it's when you taste the wine, you see it's, it's very much that concentration. And then the acidity that just cleanses your palate, the wines are bone dry. So there's no RS, there's no sweet coin character. And they're just, they, they just smell and taste like the berries do one. That's one of the, my, one of my favorite things of harvest is, you know, we, we harvest in, Pretty much after everything, um, with the exception of Seascape Chardonnay, a couple other things, some some years. But it's the end of the season, and you have ripeness and you have flavor in the grapes. But we're waiting for the acidity to drop. So you're out there, you've been harvesting and tasting grapes and walking vineyards for two months, and you're out there, and the last grapes you're picking are the highest acid, and they're ripping your mouth apart because of the acidity. And you're like, I can't pick this for another week but it tastes great and your mouth almost hurts from the acidity, but that translates into a wine when it's finished in the bottle that's really lively and again, elegant, so. Thank you. It's in school. We have one last Pandora's box question in the Q&A with four minutes left. Uh, what's your view on uh, natural wines and the usage of SO2? 
You want to go or you want me to go, Christy? Uh, I'll go and then you can go after me. Okay. I, you know, I, I think as humans, we're always looking for what's new and next and different. And uh, I think natural wines are, are having that moment. Um, I always love trying new and different things. I think as winemakers, we're very open-minded and we like experimenting and we like exploring. I haven't yet found one that I, I think is absolutely amazing that I want to drink the whole bottle. And I think Jeff can agree with me that when we like to drink wine, we like to drink the whole bottle most of the time. And, and um, you know, I, I think they're interesting. I, I think it's always important that we winemakers stay curious and we always keep experimenting. And so I think that's important. Um, it's not a style of wine I make, but I appreciate that people are, are trying things. And if they, they happen upon something that, that's really lovely and that other people like, that's fantastic. Um, if they can do it with less SO2, that's, that's great. I think SO2 and, and sulfur get a really bad rap that, that people don't realize how it's in so many products we consume. If you have um, orange juice in the morning, if you eat any dried fruit or breakfast cereal, it, it's in all of that. And so. I don't think it should be as demonized as it is in the wine world. Um, it, it's a very regular part of many things we consume and it's, it's an antioxidant and we use it for that and, and to help keep the wine sound. And I feel like it's my job as a producer to give you guys wines that, that are, are, are sound and good quality and that I have faith that you will enjoy them. So that's what we work toward every day. More power to people who are trying and experimenting with things. Yeah, what, what I... My, my view is kind of like, well, what is natural wine? It's kind of this very vague, there's no definition for it. You could say there's a camp of natural winemakers who, who you know, basically the, the, the rules they, they say are out there, you know, you can't add sulfur, you can't add anything to the grapes. Well, if that's the case, then I'm a natural winemaker because I don't add sulfur at the juice stage. I will add small amounts of, of, of sulfites later to make sure the wine doesn't taste like crap uh, when someone buys it. But um, I don't use any cultured yeast. I don't add malolactic bacteria. I don't filter my wine. So I, I look at what I do and it's, you know, to some people that would be natural. To other people, oh, that's not natural. And I think, where natural wines have gotten a bad rap from some people is, is where it becomes an excuse for spoilage. And, you know, when a wine tastes bad and the VA is through the roof and it's brown and the excuse is, well, it's natural wine, it's supposed to be that way. It's like, well, you know, if I, if I, went, if I went to my butcher and, uh, you know, I, I bought a piece of uh, dry aged ribeye but they didn't bother cutting off, you know, the outer layer of mold and dried up stuff that, that had formed. And they did a really sloppy job in presentation. I really wouldn't be excited about paying the 40 bucks a pound for that beautiful dry aged ribeye. Um, so I think it's a, there's some interesting wines out there. I, I laugh at it because it's kind of like, you know, orange wines became the cool kid thing, you know, the last few years and, and they're really interesting. I look at Rod Berglund over at Joseph Salon. He's been making orange wine for 25 years. No one paid attention to him. You know, he's got Grenache Blanc that he's made an orange wine from for 25 years. And, and is he a trendsetter? Oh, well, yeah. I mean, the guy's one of the best winemakers in the world. But, you know, he's not part of that cool kid crew necessarily. So, you know, define what it is. I, I think the less you can put into a wine, the better. But I also think at the end of the day, it's our jobs to make wines that taste good and make people happy. So I well, thank, thank you both for, like I said, answering that uh, hot potato question about- <laughs> That's an easy one. I, I, I know I thought we we'd have a hard one today. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we are just uh, past four o'clock, so I know we got to run. So before I hand it off to Paula, I thank everyone on here. I just want to say a quick thank you to all the participants who joined in from uh, across the country. And I know we have got quite a few from Quebec who have joined in. So, uh, merci bien pour uh, cet après-midi. And Paula, uh, I will turn it over to you for, for the closing words. Thank you so much, Mark. Honestly, we could have sat here and talked for hours and hours on end. Jeff and Christy, you guys are awesome. Uh, what a great afternoon reconnecting after a summer hiatus. 
Mark, fantastic moderating. Thank you so much. The questions just keep rolling in. So we could keep this going, but I know the, the, the winemakers have to get back to their actual real job of producing the great wines that we enjoyed this afternoon. They, it was really interesting to learn how your different appellations and your different sites impart their characteristics and all these wines. And it was just a wonderful experience. I want to thank you both very, very much for, for spending this time with us this afternoon. Thanks to all the audience who joined us. Thank you again, Mark, for uh, all your help in pulling this together and your agents. And I have to say, we're going to continue this because everybody's having so much fun. Uh, on October 19th, we've got another series of great winemakers lined up like Christy and Jeff joining us from Cake Bread Cellars, Sequoia Grove, and St. Francis Winery for uh, for October, 8, October 19th at two o'clock. So let's keep the discussion about great California wine going. I want to thank you guys all from Jackson Family Wine Estates for joining us. Everyone have a great afternoon. Enjoy the wines and thank you again for your time. Good, goodbye, everybody. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, everyone.